Um, I'm a researcher at the University of New South Wales. Um, I finished my PhD back in 2008, um, and they've been kind of transitioning slowly uh, into the realm of freshwater ecology, um, and in particular, platypuses. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about conserving conservation uh, and applying science for, for guiding management and, and, you know, and, and general education and, and outreach. Um, so that is my true passion. Um, about, it all, I guess it all started, or in, in terms of my relationship with platypuses, um, started about eight years ago, uh, where we started having conversations with uh, Tom Grant. Um, in, if um, he's, in, for those who don't know, uh, Tom, uh, Tom has dedicated his entire life to researching and studying platypuses. Um, and, um, I, the conversations that we started having with Tom, um, as well as our partners at Taronga Zoo, it was apparent that um, there was a lot of information, the life history, behavior, um, and things like that around the, the, the peculiarness of the platypus. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of information about the what we call the conservation status of the platypus. We we were not there were there 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 still isn't. I'll get to it. But there were, at the time, uh, there were a handful of studies that looked uh, at and tracked platypus populations over time, um, and even those were very patchy. Um, mostly Tom Grant, that's been going back to the Shoalhaven for over forty years, now surveying this population over time. And the importance of serving a population over time is that you can, it allows you to change um, and associate that change to um, things that like the change in the environment or, the, or changes that uh, human mediated changes. Um, so we, it was clear that there wasn't a lot of information about how platypuses were faring. Uh, there are, um, and so that's how kind of we started, I started getting into it. Um, Together with Professor Richard Kingsford, um, we successfully uh, got some money um, and embarked on a what started as a three-year project looking at platypuses in reg and the impact of river regulation. Um, eventually, kind of grew um, as we've gained and we're gaining knowledge. Um, and, and today, um, it's been a few years since that project ended, but we're still. Uh, even more involved in, in platypus conservation um, and, and education. Uh, so, um, Tanil Hawk, so I'll be presenting a fair bit of information that uh, Tanil Hawk was the Richard was the lead uh, CI, uh, but since Tanil's uh, graduated and she's a doctor and now she's a full time researcher, also uh, uh, helping me chase around platypuses uh, wherever we go. Um, and so, okay, yeah, I guess that's, uh, so that's me on, that's me on a good day, that's me on a bad day, and that's uh, Tanil there, um, and this is uh, Richard Kingsford. Um, so it, generally, I'll cover a few things very briefly about the platypus, but uh, should you desire to dive uh, deeper into the world of platypuses, there's the book Platypus that Tom Grant uh, edited and wrote. Um, and there's also a, um, an open source publication that anyone can access um, that we published a few years ago. Uh, we had, it was a lead up, we had a, a conference of, uh, or a workshop of all the platypus researchers out there. So you can, there are not that many, I can tell you that. Uh, but we got together and we had a chat and, and then we published this kind of review about the, the current knowledge about the life of the platypus um, and, and um, its status and, and threats. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a concise um, paper that you can also read. Uh, platypuses in a Aboriginal culture um, varies uh, depending on, um, again, not most, I guess it, Early European colonists, or did not dive into, or saw the the not, not knowledge sharing with uh, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, 
Um, but this, on some occasion, um, in, there's one case in Tasmania where a naturalist um, was engaging there with uh, trying to, I guess, um, it, it investigate or study this peculiar creatures, these, uh, you know, strange and beautiful creatures of Australia. Um, so he was mentioning seeing um, uh, indigenous people in Tasmania, they were hunting the platypuses, either digging them from their burrows uh, or hunting them with spears. Um, uh, in terms of like uh, the, the tail in the platypus, I can imagine has a fair bit of uh, fat. That's where platypuses store their fat. And so potentially, you know, that other than that, I, I, platypuses are cute and, and adorable, but uh, like they're never, I, and they never, they're not like, they don't seem very appeasing to be honest to eat. Um, so I'm not too sure that was a dominant thing, um, but more to, I'm more to, uh, to study. And so that's something I'm also trying to engage with indigenous people, trying to better understand um, what 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 their what's their value perspective and knowledge um, uh, so that's still in progress um, at the time when we were writing this paper I did some digging around uh, I came across two Dreamtime stories that relate to platypuses and again their uh, location is 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 relevant um, so not all peoples or indigenous people and nations uh, across Eastern Australia have the same story about platypuses, but one is from kind of the, the, the around Naran Lakes, um, kind of the Western flowing river uh, in New South Wales, uh, where the story, and that's one of the, the, the one of the, the most known stories about of, of uh, the platypus creation is, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a peculiar one um, that I'm sure has a lot of, um, you know, messages uh, conveyed there. Um, but generally, it's a story about a duck uh, that uh, it, it living in a with uh, yeah, in a village of ducks, I guess, our family, our clan of ducks, um, and is warned not to go venturing if further downstream because of the devil Bigun. Um, but she ignores them, ventures off, and then gets abducted by our water rat, uh, who takes her as his wife. Um, but then she manages to escape and goes back to her family um, and then lays two eggs uh, from which platypuses hatch. Um, and then she is exiled from, banished from her family and sent up into the mountains uh, where she stays and, and raises her, her young, the platypus. Um, I like this story. Um, Mostly like the, the geographic context is interesting, I find. That's my personal interpretation, perhaps, where the story where the story comes from is not an area that we know, like the western flowing downstream, western flowing rivers are, don't do not support as many platypuses as the, the upper reaches of those western flowing rivers. And so I'm wondering, you know, perhaps there's like this geographic context there. Um, another Dreamtime story um, from kind of southern uh, New South Wales, kind of central coast, um, is about um, the, the, um, the ancestral spirit uh, handing out the different like totems and traits of the different animals. Um, and all the other, all the animals go to the platypus and the echidna and uh, ask them to join them and to be part of their group. Um, and so the platypus and the echidna kind of go back and they have this discussion and then they come back to all of these animals and they say, thank you so much. But we, we think we kind of, we, uh, we appreciate the diversity of nature and would like to not like be part of everyone kind of thing. And then, then that's how kind of it, they, they get all of these uh, weird traits combined into uh, one uh, as animal. Um, so those are kind of really just uh, snippets, but I'm sure there are, there's a uh, greater depth and diversity of stories and values to um, uh, for platypus, uh, of platypuses for indigenous people. Um, the number one question that we get as platypus researchers is what is the plural form of platypus? Though I did say it a few times already. Um, so we usually, like it's either platypi or platypuses. Um, 
the correct term is platypuses, and, and it's because of the root of the name uh, is Greek and not Latin. If it was Latin, it was platypi, but because it's Greek, it's actually platypuses, uh, or platypoda or platypodes uh, is, might be also um, correct, but that would be dangerous. So uh, platypuses, um, the collective noun of platypuses, uh, by the way, I'm trying to, there's this, uh, there's no collective noun, but there's no formal. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I think there's a, like a, a puddle of platypuses and I'm trying to promote the pandemonium, pandemonium of platypuses. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of knowledge uh, of platypuses, this is kind of a summary of all the research that's uh, researchers that have looked into platypuses. Um, and you can see um, on the right there, that's kind of the number of studies and, and where uh, that, that have occurred. You can see uh, like that a bit of fine to the Southern extent. Um, can you see my mouse cursor just to know? Yeah, you can. So um, some of these studies here is what we've actually, what I did uh, back in 2016. So we've integrated them into the border rivers um, and, and we added, uh, did more here, but at the time when we started, yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's still very patchy. Um, and I'll, I'll get into also the kind of the baseline of, of um, the distribution in a second, but this is just the studies. And then in terms of like the studies over time, as we're tracking them, um, definitely there's been kind of an explosion of studies of research looking into platypuses since kind of the 1990s, late 1990s, um, and looking into the various aspects uh, of platypuses um, uh, over time. Yeah. Um, and I, there's this uh, thing about these uh, peaks also that they correspond with uh, platypus researchers getting together and sharing ideas and then collaborating and writing papers together. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the evolutionary history of the, the platypus, uh, this goes back uh, almost 200 million years ago where you still had dinosaurs still roam the earth. Uh, there, then you had those uh, uh, weird creatures um, that diverged. Um, from they they diverged before mammals, placenta mammals, and macropods diverged. So that lineage of platypuses and echidnas uh, is rooted in our kind of very deep in our history. Um, and so they will get a bit into their second. Um, uh, uh, is the, is the cause why platypuses have this kind of weird combination of different traits. Um, there are uh, fossils of platypuses in South, uh, in Patagonia, um, around in South America. And so um, I, I'd, I'd expect also to find them really in, in probably in Antarctica if we had a good look. Um, so that's kind of relating to the, the, uh, my, my movement of, uh, of tectonic, like tectonics and, uh, and continents uh, over time. And, and today uh, there were some precursors of platypuses. Um, bigger variations, uh, the megapus um, in, in central Australia, uh, but today there's only one species of platypus. Um, there's some like genetically, there's some subpopulations, roughly four populations. There's kind of the Northern and then New South Wales kind of is divided to half, maybe like a great dividing range and then Tasmania. Um, yeah. Um, platypuses uh, have uh, very strange uh, and lovely traits. Um, I'll start from the top to the bottom, I guess, the, starting with the bill. Uh, it has very sensitive electroreceptors uh, and mechanoreceptors, which it uses uh, to hunt and find um, its prey. Uh, platypuses, when they dive, they they close their eyes um, and use, sorry, I'm blocking my own. They use the, the webbing in the front feet 
uh, to swim. And so they do this like with the, with the front feet, they move and they tuck the back feet. They don't have any webbing on the back feet. They tuck them behind uh, the tail and use that to maneuver. Um, Platypus is when the movement is more like a crocodile and less like a, what you would expect of a mammal, just the, the way the, the bones are structured. Uh, male platypuses have venomous spurs. Uh, it's about a centimeter to one and a half centimeters long. Uh, only the males, female platypuses are born with vestigial spurs, very tiny spurs that kind of disappear after six months. Uh, which that's why it makes uh, aging female platypuses very difficult. We can, in terms of the aging platypuses, we can look at the spur. It has this sheath. Uh, when they're juveniles, it's completely, the spur is completely covered with the sheath and it slowly contracts to kind of determine their age. Platypuses, uh, recently we revised the, like the generation length, length is seven years. Uh, they can live up to 10, 15 years in the wild. Um, platypuses eat macroinvertebrates and they have these like they don't have any teeth they have a grinding pads you can't see them they're in the back there um, which they mush their food and they have cheek pouches where they store a bit so they'll dive kind of almost like filter feeds there's a lot of sand and mud um, and, and then we, we, we take some samples uh, when we process uh, platypuses, um, I'll show you. They're sleeping platypuses. We don't uh, stress them. Um, yeah, so um, so they store it in their cheek pouches, then they surface, and then they kind of do that. Sometimes, I don't know if you've seen a platypus foraging, they'll dive, they come up, and then they, they'll do this kind of thing with their mouth. Um, strangely enough, platypuses have five sex chromosomes, five pairs of sex chromosomes. Who knows? Uh, again, one of these like weird things about platypuses. Um, the bill is very leathery to feel um, and platypuses it's interesting uh, the fur, fur these are just corkinesses that I can like you know just uh, like I think we Tanil and I are counting we've handled uh, almost 300 platypuses to date um, so but it's still fascinating um, they have uh, like three different types of fur there's the soft back one the tail has very bristly uh, fur and then a very soft down uh, and it's kind of silver almost um, on their bellies. Um, what else can I tell? Um, and yeah, I think that's that. Um, we always assume that a platypus is male until proven otherwise. So if you don't like, it, don't try and pick up a platypus. Um, the the spurring by a platypus, I'm, I'm told, that the pain can last for up six up to six months, immobilizing muscle pain. Uh, morphine apparently doesn't help. So, uh, yeah, observe from afar, as they say. Um, the we we call them puggles, uh, baby platypuses. Uh, this is these are platypus eggs, um, and the platypuses they have a nesting burrow and they have a Breeding, the females build a breeding burrow um, during the breeding season. Uh, breeding burrows can be a very complex, like about 30, almost 30 meters in, in kind of zigzagging chambers with dead ends, um, and they plug some sections. Um, the nesting burrows tend to be further up uh, the river. Uh, that's something we're looking into in the snowy at the moment. Um, there's like these big fluctuations of water re they release once a year big pulses of water. So we're looking into the impact on whether there is any impact on, on the nesting of platypuses. Um, yeah, so the platypuses uh, lay, they, female platypuses, okay, so the breeding. Breeding starts around August, September. Uh, there's this, it's uh, Jessica Thomas from Hillsdale Sanctuary has done amazing work there looking at uh, the breeding behavior of platypuses. Uh, the females really choose when to breed. They would avoid the males um, until they're suitable. And then there's this bit of a courtship um, breeding. Um, I will let you Google uh, images, how platypus penises look like, but they're, uh, I've seen that once live, they're very peculiar and horrific. It's kind of a double headed with spikes. Um, and I, so I, I think echidna has like a three heads spiky thing. So yeah, I'll let you uh, do that. Um, and so there's this courtship, this chase, 
gestation is about two weeks. Um, and then they, uh, during that time, they build their nesting bars. They carry and build a nest in, in the bank of rivers and lay egg, they lay their two eggs there. And then would, um, the females don't have any teats. They have uh, like a mammary gland, which secretes milk, which has, um, because it's, it, it, because it's exposed, it doesn't have, it has very high antimicrobial, uh, properties. Um, so there's studies just about the milk of, of platypuses. Um, but so the, the female, the mother would rear her young until about, so it starts around August, September. Um, and then it depends on the climate and where, and then it would, um, the mom would rear her young for about three, four months. And then the platypus is the, um, uh, emerge around January. Uh, Jess, Jess from Hillsfield made this, uh, funny, um, observation there where there was one time where the mom was actually pushing her young out of the burrow and blocking the entrance um and so um you when when time when mom's ready she uh she'll kick the uh, kids out um we're not too sure uh how long they linger the juveniles around their natal area and if it's important or if there's any like supplemental feeding all of that is like we're still don't know uh, we've, we've tried on a number of occasions, but, uh, still, still more to investigate. Um, the platypus is obviously an Australian icon. Uh, I think we, we, um, and I think there's a lot of value. It's funny. I'll get into the, like the conservation status of the platypus. Um, but we look, it's such an emblem, uh, yet, um, there hasn't been a lot of action into monitoring and conserving platypuses. Um, yeah. And, and I think the platypus has um, a, a very uh, like the capacity of um, being what we call is like a flagship species for freshwater conservation and protection of rivers. Um, it, it's you know it's that, like that cute furry creature that can help connect people uh, and care about their rivers um, and and definitely by protecting platypuses because where it lies in this kind of food web, uh, kind of at the top of it. Um, you really, by protecting platypuses, uh, you're protecting a, a, a large number of other species um, in the river as well. Um, in terms of platypus habitat, um, we have a, like a very qualitative understanding of what platypus is like, uh, but it's not quantitative. We're working on that uh, in terms of actually measure for a platypus what it means uh, like a good good habitat for a platypus. Um, food, so they eat macroinvertebrates. Uh, there's this notion that they eat yabbies, um, which they feed the yabbies at, at, in captive in, in, in zoos, so they definitely can eat yabbies. Uh, but studies that have looked into the diet of platypuses um, in, in the wild um, have... Um, mostly come up with all like the the um, dragon the nymph stages of these large um, what we call macro invertebrates, uh, so fly larvae, dragonfly larvae, and things like that. Um, I can send you read more about that. Um, so in terms of sustaining uh, like macro invertebrates, you need to think about also like the like the water quality. Uh, is is important for the macroinvertebrates, um, and then in terms of the habitat, organic input, and you know like pristine water, all of those are really important. So you're thinking about the riparian vegetation and that benthic complexity in the river with logs and debris and all of that. All of that are really critical for a healthy freshwater uh, system. Um, and then in terms of the riparian vegetation, they offer two things for the platypuses as well. There is shelter, they keep the water cool. Uh, platypuses have a specific, very uh, limited uh, thermal tolerance. Um, and so that's really important, particularly in, in arid and hot environments. Um, and so that coolness um, and then Stable banks are critical for river health and for platypuses. Uh, will smother rivers um, not only at the riparian scale, but even catchment scale processes of increased sedimentation destroy rivers. Um, I'm just now in the Shoalhaven River, and it's really sad to see the amount of sand slugs that are pushing and filling up the pools. Um, they're just 
cattle, for instance, uh, like the erosion that produced by cattle is, is catastrophic. And so it's really important to protect that riparian zone, um, promote the, the stability of these river banks uh, where platypuses can build their burrows um, as well. Uh, in terms of the range where platypuses occur, uh, they go all the way from, have a look, this is like an app I'm developing at the moment, it's cplatypus.org. What it does is like it, it consolidates all data that we have on uh, Atlas of Living Australia um, and summarizes it um, by the recency of observation. Um, and we're developing a capacity to also report observations there and also um, uh, facilitate and hold community events uh, where you would say, all right, let's you know organize a sea platypus event, get together uh, so you can register an RSVP and all of that. So that's, we're promoting that. Hopefully we'll do the big launch uh, in the next uh, couple of months, uh, but you can now go there and, and you could see uh, platypus observations. Um, you, then the, the grayish is what, where they may have or still occur um village in queensland is very patchy we don't know a lot i have this desire of going and trying to look at platypuses in queensland and you know maybe like do a wrestling uh freshwater crocodiles and platypuses uh see how they like what's the i'm curious to know uh what's going on there um and then in new south wales it's patchy the colors is like the decade where that observation was uh made um and it's summarized at like a 25 by 25 grid so Red means that that platypus, a platypus hasn't been seen in that area for over 30 years. Yellow is like 20 years, light green is 10 years, and, and, and bright green is, uh, you know, the last decade. Uh, you can definitely, some patterns emerge. Um, you can see all of these red, unfortunately, uh, cells in the western flowing rivers of the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, where river regulation and land clearing and, and degradation of rivers has occurred. Um, uh, hasn't fared well for, for freshwater species and the platypus as well. Um, I'll get to it in a second. Platypus is used to occur in South Australia. Um, there's a, like probably an error here for that green one. Uh, so they're all but gone from South Australian mainland, uh, but there's an introduced population on Kangaroo Island. Um, again, there's a lot of uncertainty in uh, Tasmania as well, which is kind of a considered a safe haven for platypuses. Another thing I forgot to mention about the traits is that it's uh, quite interesting, uh, more size-wise, morphology-wise, there's a huge variation in the, in the body size of platypuses, uh, which is kind of like the thermoregulation uh, of species. Uh, generally, uh, they, they get smaller and smaller as you go north uh, into the hotter climates. Um, and in Tasmania, you have these monsters, like a three kilo, 70, 60 centimeters long platypuses, whereas um, kind of our way, and as you get further up, um, males go down to about a kilo and a half. So, so it's almost half the size. Um, yeah, so there's this kind of variation as well. Um, so the, uh, yeah, that's like in terms of our knowledge across the range. One second, I thought I had something, okay. Um, threats to platypuses are varied and many, um, starting with uh, early European colonization, um, and extensive hunting of platypus fur. This is a, like a, this is a platypus rug in the Australian Museum. Uh, Tanil did this uh, chapter in her, in her thesis. She looked at old historical newspapers and the fur trade. And you have these accounts of like thousands and thousands and thousands of platypuses were uh, pelts were sold in the markets. Um, there was a that kind of formal protection in 1912 uh, across all states, um, but it wasn't. Uh, um, there was it was probably a lag there as well because there wasn't a lot of uh, enforcement, um, and we know that some of them might have been sold as like possum furs and, and things like that. Um, starting with the like easy ones, um, pollution, uh, either through the water quality or even hair ties, uh, loose uh, fishing lures, all of that can strangle platypuses and kill them. This is uh, like a platypus we, we, we saw, came across with a fishing line. It's just, they get snagged on the roots while they're foraging and they can just drown or it can cut into their skin. 
Um, so they're very sensitive. The way they forage with their head just means that anything circular can get up into their neck. Um, so that's very unfortunate. Uh, opera house traps, uh, closed yabby traps, are death traps to uh, platypuses. A, like there's a single, they're so cheap to buy, uh, a single trap in the river can stay there forever uh, and just keep killing platypuses. So the platypuses come, go in and they drown. Uh, the, there was one net that was found and had the remains of 12 platypuses inside. So um, really hor horrific. Um, and there are alternatives to catching yabbies. Um, they've been banned in Victoria, uh, banned in ACT, uh, kind of banned in New South Wales, but it's not been very promoted in terms of like, they're still around. They, these, you can still find these traps. And I think since sometimes like VCF still sells them. And so um, it's not being phased out as quickly as uh, should be. And they're still legal in, in some, in Queensland. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of, uh, River regulation, obviously water is critical for platypuses. Uh, a dry river cannot sustain platypuses. So river regulation in terms of abstraction and changing the, taking water uh, and, and changing the timing of water as well to meet uh, agricultural uh, demands um, can alter the, the condition of like the macroinvertebrates and water quality and things like that and can impact platypuses and obviously large dams also fragment population. So there are issues here in terms of um, like the genetic as well as the long-term viability of platypus populations. Um, uh, um, sedimentation, erosion is, is a big, uh, big thing as well. Um, again, um, both at the riparian scale and the catchment scale, uh, which I mentioned before, and invasive species, particularly foxes, uh, pose a threat to platypuses. They, platypuses have been seen to move over land, either like a dispersal event by juveniles trying to get to the other side of a ridge or between river systems. Uh, and so you can imagine in terms of like the land clearing and invasive species is like that, that, that movement over land that used to occur and still occurs a lot in Tasmania. I um, mean, the mainland is probably non-existent. Um, but also during dry periods where platypuses need to walk along a dry riverbed, uh, to find a deep pool, a refugia pool. Um, that's when we know there are increased um, observations uh, of, of predation by foxes. Um, also in terms of sedimentation, I guess you can think about these like synergies between threatening processes um, where we're just like increased sedimentation and, and um, uh, sh making rivers a bit more shallow means that during dry, dry periods, during droughts, rivers tend to dry faster. And so you, you can think about like erosion, climate change, uh, unsustainable abstraction of water, both, on, both large dams, uh, but also on farm storages. Like you can think of uh, that, that has a compounding effect on the amount of water that actually goes down the catchment to the rivers. Um, so, so all of these kind of um, threatening processes really interact with each other and, um, and um, to form these like, um, like synergies that, that drive local populations to extinction. Uh, in terms of the conservation status of the platypus, um, currently it's not listed uh, federally. We did a, a submission early la late last year, early this year um, to try and get the species listed. Um, as a threatened species, um, there was a. Unfortunately, there's not a lot enough information to back this. There's a, like we, the amount of we we left no stone unturned, as they say, um, and there's some indication of significant declines in some areas, but but generally, like we couldn't reach those kind of uh, thresholds. Um, but the, the, the scientific committee acknowledged that it was a bit of a, um, so it, it might get a, like a special designation listing of a provisional. So it might, um, might attract more attention in terms of monitoring and um, getting more, like uh, accumulating more uh, knowledge and, and monitoring to maybe perhaps reevaluate it in five years. In South Australia, it's endangered. Uh, all but gone from the mainland and in Victoria in 2020, early this year, it was listed as a threatened species, um, not because of its like current status, but also um, with increased frequency and severity of droughts, uh, definitely pose a threat to platypuses.
Uh, IUCN, which is kind of the global standard, um, it's listed as a near threatened. Um, we're currently engaged with them to try and um, uh, downgrade uh, the listing to uh, vulnerable. Um, yeah, so just in terms of like declining numbers um, and the evidence and things we've looked at, um, Tanil was looking at Trove. It's kind of the a digitized library of all newspapers um, and reports. And she was looking at mentions of platypuses in like the early 1900s. Um, and what we came across was, a, for us, was a very clear indication that in some areas, I'm not saying that you know, in, in some areas they're still pristine today, you can still see a lot of platypuses, but in, in a lot of areas where you go today, for instance, the year someone saw 22 platypuses were caught. Uh, the effort, uh, we, like our maximum was seven. Uh, so like getting 22 in a day is, uh, is amazing. Um, so you have all these accounts of these large numbers of platypuses, like 15, I've never seen 15. Someone had this, like they're even referring to them as like a mob. There's one account um, on the wider, someone saying that it was a platypus migration moving upstream. Like I would like, I, I would like to come up with a, like the term, an adjective, like, a, or to try and describe it as a migration that has to be. A, a lot of platypuses. Um, and then you have these accounts of people walking around and shooting so many platypuses. Um, so, uh, you know, like even if I tried now to go and shoot platypuses, um, I, I would never be able to get to 16 or 18 in the day. So, um, and so this is like a bit of a comparison we, we did in, in specific areas, sorry, uh, in specific areas, what it used to be and what it is now. Um, so it, it's very anecdotal, obviously, um, but it, it, it does, we think, uh, is yet another example of what we call as the shifting baseline. It's kind of this, uh, when, we, when we don't have good data, then like our memory doesn't last long, our, our collective memory doesn't last long, um, and, and things can change. Um, so this is here on the right is an example of like, uh, he's like, uh, you know, you go out on a fishing trip. And so this is like the amount they used to catch in 1957. This is the amount in 1980. And then this is already in 2007. And so you can imagine if we didn't have these photos and someone would go out without any knowledge of what it used to be and catch this, this size and this amount, um, you know, you wouldn't have a capacity to say, oh, this is like a, you know, a, a shadow of what it used to be. And, and humans can drive species to extinction very quickly. Um, this is an example of the, like the passenger pigeon. It was estimated 1.3 billion individuals that were driven to extinction with like uh, very quickly. I can't remember exactly a few, a few like let's say a, a half a century. Um, you know, the, the the passenger pigeon used to darken the the skies uh, at time, but um, um, like land use, land clearing, and destruction of habitat, and, and the shooting, and all of that um, drove that species to extinction. And so we think that there is, it, um, there has been this effect um, a, for many of Australia's biodiversity fauna. I uh, gone to the the river and and seen just you know like a pandemonium of platypuses there. Um, and so it's it's yeah uh, unfortunate. Um, yeah, so this is again just trying to summarize decline in distribution. I already kind of talked about that um, in those grids uh, before, but you can see kind of this like emerging pattern of uh, disappearance or decline of platypuses in really western flowing rivers. Some patches you get, um, and then like this kind of knowledge gap that we have up in Queensland. Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of like uh, trying to assess and how we actually catch platypuses. Um, it's a big effort. Um, we, it depends on like the morphology of the river in, in deep pools, deep rivers, we go and we set an unweighted, uh, mesh net in the river. Um, I'm just checking, how am I going in terms of time? I've got, uh, what is it? Five, quarter past five. I've got a bit more time. Um, so. Yeah, so we go, we set the, uh, the nets uh, parallel to the bank 
um, in an un unweighted mesh net, and then we sit uh, by the net, um, and anything, any movement, if a platypus gets caught in the net, it surfaces. So we go back in our tinny. So we sit there with the spotlight uh, at night, any movement, anything, we go with the tinny, we, we catch the platypus, um, we put it in a pillowcase, um, wrap it in a towel, uh, and, and, and then put it in a quiet place. And when it's ready, we, when we're ready and it's ready, uh, we kind of uh, take some samples and look at it. Um, so, but we have to be very attentive when we're setting these nets uh, and we can't leave them. Um, and then in shallower rivers and creeks, um, we set these kind of spikes with a cod end. This is not a great example, um, but uh, what we do is we put them in pairs, one facing up, one facing down, and a platypus gets kind of funneled into these chambers and, and the platypus can come back. Um, we catch all sorts of different other species uh, in, in the fikes, um, like ducks, water dragons, eels, turtles, uh, yeah, the, the, um, and, and fish, and yabbies, uh, crayfish. Um, so these nets, what we do is we check them every three hours, because um, a platypus can kind of just hang in there um, up here quite easily. Um, so we check them throughout the night. Every three hours, we go, we check, we release anything that's not a platypus, and any platypus we catch again, we take with us. Um, and then we take some samples um, and, and release back uh, into the river. Um, this is us. Uh, I think I talked about uh, the, the study that we did in terms of looking at river regulation um, and fragmentation of platypuses. So this is us setting up uh, like a field camp um, from which we go every night and, and survey platypuses. Um, so when we do catch a platypus, uh, such a big effort, um, we make try and make the most out of it. So one thing that was very important for, for me when to start doing this was to make sure that we're not stressing animals. So um, I, uh, I anesthetize the platypuses. Uh, so when I'm kind of processing them and looking them over, they're sleeping. Um, so that minimizes rest on, you know, uh, the, minimizes the stress on platypuses as well as on myself. Um, and it really gives me uh, an opportunity to have a kind of an in-depth look, take all the measurements and swabs and samples that I need uh, without, um, you know, stressing the animal. So yeah, all of these platypuses are sleeping. Um, and it's isofluorine. It's a, it's a, it's a great drug um, for anesthetizing animals. Um, yeah, we had never had any issues. So that's great. So we do that in the field. We have this like induction chamber and there are face masks that kind of I built from uh, a milk bottle. Um, yeah, so it works great. Uh, when we catch a platypus, we tag it like a pet, like household pets. That gives us a way to identify individuals over time as well to assess uh, population change and demographics and all of that. Um, we take and then we start taking like as many samples as we can really uh we look at those like take blood samples we take biopsies for dna we look at the health and so we've got all these like gazillion different swabs uh platypuses have a cloaca that's another trait uh, like a bird um so just a single opening uh so we do like all these swabs and things like that take feces urine uh, we look at fur, nail, and cheek pouches to uh, study the diet of platypuses um, and then mor morphology, breeding. And we've also studied the movement of platypuses as well. So we can uh, attach uh, little trackers on them um, to see like movement and identify burrows and things like that. Um, in our study, just to give you an example, this is like three years worth of field work. Uh, spending, I did the first year and then Sunil did her uh, the second and third year. So this is like for about six months going week on week off. So this is like in really intensive. And there's no other way, like I'll get to the eDNA things, but uh, the eDNA is great for presence absence, um, for like landscape scale assessment. Unfortunately, uh, there's no escape from actually doing the, like the hard effort uh, and collecting samples from platypuses to gain knowledge about, you know, all of the things that I mentioned. Um, so this is us doing the hard work, uh, which culminates with like a few uh, figures uh, and, a, and hopefully a paper. Um, what we looked at was we looked at platypus populations above and below large dams in three different river regions across New South Wales and Northern Victoria, um, and also like an adjacent free flowing river. Um, so for instance, the, up in the border rivers, um, below, up and above and below Pindari Dam and like adjacent Tenterfield. Um, 
we were looking at platypus populations and what was apparent to us was that um, there was a numbers of, of number of platypuses in downstream of the large dam were lower, um, but it, they were not, uh, I'll get to that in a second, they were lower, but still relatively um, good-ish. Um, in comparison, uh, for instance, when we went to the Upper Murray, we did um, down on Dartmouth Dam, uh, above and below Pindari, uh, sorry, above and below Dartmouth Dam and the adjacent ovens. First thing is the numbers were lower, and we know that that population was, uh, those populations were still recovering from the millennium drought. Um, so um, there's this like very long and lingering effect of, of, uh, of droughts on, on rivers um, and, and the species that inhabit them. Um, but what was uh, really sad for us was to see the condition of platypuses downstream of the dam, uh, where the extent of regulation was severe. Like they've, uh, contrary to the Severn River, where there's abstraction of water uh, and there's somewhat regulation, the timing of the releases hasn't changed from the natural, the kind of the natural hydro, hydrology of the river. Whereas in the Mida Mida, um, they've completely altered the hydrology of the river uh, just to meet irrigation demands uh, downstream on the, the um, on the Murray, and so the the condition of the water quality it was uh, like very was very poor. There were algaes, uh, algae, algae, uh, macroinvertebrate communities were depleted. You would go on the Mina Mina. It's uh, on the outside. It's a lovely river. Like this was when we first got there. It was like wow, amazing, pristine. Uh, we're sure to catch. Platypus is here, um, but unfortunately, like this was, it was so poor. It was, it was. We spent twelve weeks. We caught only four platypuses. Um, it was very sad. Um, on the snowy, it was really interesting. Uh, really good numbers downstream of Jindabyne Dam, um, which I think really exemplifies the restoration efforts. Um, you know, I, like I don't know if you know, like since the when the, the, the snowy, um, when they built the, the um, Jindabyne Dam back in kind of the late 60s, 70s, they transfer the 99% of the water that used to flow down the snowy down all the way to Orbos in Victoria, they transferred to the other side, to the Murrumbidgee. Um, and so the snowy was brought down to a trickle, 1% of what it used to be. Um, and then only um, as a result of like strong advocacy um, they, um, and, and they started bringing some of that water back. Now it's almost up to about 20%. So that's been going on for about 15 years or so. Um, and so it really exemplifies the, the recovery of the population there, um, which had, uh, were really good high numbers. Um, it was interesting at the time, and we're still, now we've got a study there. Um, there were very low juvenile numbers on the snow and so we're, we're not sure about if those spring releases that they do there, um, but for another time maybe. Um, yeah, sorry, so this is an example of the, the Mida Mida here. So it, it just looks amazing, um, but um, the water quality is horrible and there's hardly any platypuses there. Um, these are these like, large spring releases that they do once a year from Jindabyne Dam. Uh, they do these like flushing, trying to flush sedimentation down the river as part of uh, this restoration um, effort. Uh, droughts. Um, so this is something we've also been involved in, the, like, like in almost like forced to be involved in the lead up to like uh, 2019. We were starting, to, it was so bad, like we we're starting to get phone calls from wires from people all over Australia talking about stranded platypuses and drying pools and what can we do. And unfortunately, there is nothing we can do. There's no capacity yet um, to um, rescue platypuses. Like there are no facilities. We were talking with DPI water. Maybe they can put them in fish tanks or the, the zoos were at capacity. Um, so and unfortunately, there were these accounts of, uh, of just dead platypuses in, in drying rivers. Uh, so that was very sad. Um, there were like just the importance of sustaining freshwater refugias and the impact on the Peel River. Uh, it got to a stage where they were talking about stopping all environmental flows and completely drying the river. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it got really bad. Uh, we're yet to under, fully understand what was the impact. Um, but what we did is there were some like uh, what we call like VIPs, very important platypuses that did we did manage to rescue. So this is one place in Pinandilla ACT Nature Reserve. Uh, there were stranded 
platypuses in these like refugia pools. And so we went there uh, and we rescued uh, seven platypuses and took them to Taronga Zoo, uh, where we, they, well, they, they fattened them up so quickly. It was amazing. Like when, then when they were, when the water returned, we released these platypuses back into the, uh, into the reserve. Um, and, but what, before what we did was we put little, uh, implanted little trackers on them so we can track their movements. And we, we, have, we had this study that we just finished now for about a year and a half. We were looking at the movements of platypuses and doing monthly surveys of, of food of macroinvertebrates um, and tracking the water levels. Um, Cause again, that like, we don't know exactly what are like the, what we call giving up densities and when it becomes really bad for a platypus. Um, and that's important for management. So what are the triggers for rescuing platypuses is we don't have a real quantitative, quantifiable trigger. Uh, so that's something we're working towards. Uh, fires, <clears throat> so we had the drought, then we had the fires. Um, like they, after the fires, we know fires like obviously impact terrestrial uh, systems, but because of this strong link between terrestrial and freshwater, what happens to this terrestrial environment has repercussions. Um, so on the freshwater environments, uh, in terms of like, and it really depends on what were the conditions prior to the fire um, and after the fire. If like after a fire, there's a very big dump of rain, uh, then you get all this like ash and sludge uh, gets deposited and can cause uh, mass fish kills, which was the case in some areas after the fires in 2020. Um, and so after the fires, like I, I was in a position where I was, we, we don't know really, there's some anecdotal evidence about fires not impacting platypuses in Victoria. But I, I like, I felt this, like there was a severe drought and then a fire. What's like, uh, is, is this like a, like a synergy, a compounding uh, impact? And so my first reaction was, all right, let's go where we had data on platypuses before the fires. And now I can go back and compare kind of a before and after. But just to, that's to show um, there wasn't such a thing. Um, and, it, it, and if you think about the, the, how extensive the fires were, and we didn't have any knowledge about platypus numbers in any of these areas before the fires. Um, and so kind of I resorted to doing a, a it's kind of a control and impacted. I went to uh, New South Wales mid coast uh, area um, around Port Macquarie, around Taree, if you know, Port Macquarie. Um, I looked at like, this is the Manning River here, and this is the Hack Hastings Rivers down, uh, down here. Um, and what I did was I did this, uh, I looked at Dingo Creek, the community there got really impacted, the school got burned down, um, it was one fatality, and then the impact there to the, the fire, the fire was really the, a, a big impact. Um, and I, so I did a survey there on Dingo Creek, um, and then I compared that. I also had this like neat design. It was just on the other side of the ridge, the Thone River, very similar in size, morphology, that the headwaters were not impacted by the fire, but both of them were impacted by the drought before. So if you're looking at water levels um, and discharge um, over this time, um, they were both, like there was this very severe drought, both, pe both communities on either side were saying that they've, this was the first time in, uh, that they've seen the river run dry uh, in their recollection. So there was a this severe drought and then the fires hit. Um, and this is kind of that time we came uh, about, it was about five months after we came and we surveyed platypuses there. Um, sorry. Um, what was obvious, I won't go into the detail, but the obvious thing was that um, fires had a, a big impact on the platypuses. Um, but it also showed us that in, in some areas, what we call the refugia pools, these deep pools, uh, platypus numbers were, were, were significantly higher. And the people there, really, I guess the, 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 the local knowledge is so important. Um, talking to the people there, they said they noted how platypuses were congregating in that pool, in those pools uh, during the drought. Um, so so it, there was definitely a fire impact. This is like comparing fire impacted and unimpacted. Um, it's kind of standardized by effort. I won't go into the details, but there was definitely an impact. Um, we, in the fire area, we only caught, like there was one platypus in, in, in a range. So each point is like four sites, put in a fair bit of effort. Um, yeah, so, so very low numbers. So fire definitely had a signal. Um, the following year, I really wanted to like have a, have a look again, go survey there. 
um, and and maybe like get a like a perspective about the recovery of platypuses a year after it was a lot of water ish. Um, and so I had this thing, all right, I'm going to go back and do uh, like a recovery study about platypuses and how they were faring. Um, and, and so I had everything scheduled and then there was these massive floods uh, that happened. I, you remember, I don't know if you've seen in the news that the house that was flowing down the Manning River, that, that was there. And so I went there, it, it was just as the water were, were going down, that's when, it, when I went there and, and did the surveys. Um, and the numbers were even lower in, in both rivers. So this is like a comparison, like it was, it was very depressing, uh, like spending two weeks and only catching two platypuses in both rivers. It was the debris was like it was the morphology of the river like there was like the devastation uh, was very apparent. Um, and so just this kind of really exemplifies uh, the importance of like doing monitoring over time. This is only two years in the perspectives that we're getting. I'm hoping to go back again later this year. Um, and again, you know, and just track this population over time and hopefully we'll see a recovery. Um, this is um, from the kind of the Wingy Caribbean area. Um, uh, a friend sent it to me. This is a platypus following a, f uh, a flood, and you can see kind of hanging on whether, you, you, I don't know, I'm assuming it died because of the flood, but it's hard to tell. Um, so, so flooding with debris is a big, it can be, have a big impact on platypuses. Um, yeah. 